my name is Jerry Orr. I'm the treasurer of Missoula City County Public Safety PAC. I'd like to also let you know that MCAT is filming tonight, and if we could keep the comments down in the audience uh, so that the, uh, the audio on his tape would turn out well, I'd appreciate it. On behalf of the PAC, I'd like to welcome you here tonight. We're here for several reasons. The introduction of candidates in the upcoming June primary election, and to give you a chance to learn more about our organization, the, the Missoula City County Public Safety PAC. Probably the best way to introduce ourselves would be to speak directly from our brochure that you should have received at the door when you arrived. If you haven't, raise your hand, we'll get one to you now. But we're good. In addition, you can read about us at the website, also listed on the brochure, and on that site you can read about our bylaws, updates, and how, to, how we conduct the business with the PAC. Basically, we formed the PAC approximately one year ago, after several years of discussion. The MCCPS, it's easier to say, MCCPS PAC was formed to give a political voice to law enforcement, fire, rescue, protection, corrections, emergency medicine, or any of the support services involved with these agencies. The PAC now gives a political voice to its employees in these professions. We can now be heard on a ballot and legislate legislative issues and or candidates for public office, while at the same time informing the public of our views. The Missoula City County Public Safety Political Action Committee is a fairly un unique to, the United to uh, Montana. In fact, it's the first such organization of its kind here. Briefly, let me introduce the board members of the PAC. And again, I'm Jerry Orr, and I'm the treasurer. To my right here is Phil Tillman, assistant treasurer, Pat Turner, secretary, Josh Clark, board member. If you have any questions about the PAC, we will, we will be available at the end of this uh, meeting. County Sheriff and Justice of the Peace. These are two of the basic cornerstones of the criminal justice system and the preservation of public safety. The importance of either of these offices is sometimes overlooked, but is vitally important to all of the residents of Missoula County. We take great interest in who will command the Sheriff's Department and who will preside as judges in our court system. Tonight, these candidates are vying for positions of Sheriff and Justice of the Peace. We have invited you We've invited, we invite you to relax, enjoy the refreshments, and listen to what our speakers have to say. There will be a short question and answer time provided to all candidates. And now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Phil Tillman. All right, folks, tonight we will also hear a presentation from R.J. Nelson, Chief of the Missoula County Search and Rescue. And he will speak on a uh, proposed ballot issue, which will be extremely important for all of us in the field of public safety and for the citizenry as well. And uh, they brought me up here, I guess, for the commercial. Uh, before turning to Chief Nelson and the candidates, I would like to say that the primary purpose of this gathering was to introduce you to the candidates and the issues. Like anything else, that takes money. Quite a bit of money. 100% uh, of the funding of the Missoula City County Public Safety Pact comes solely from donations and contributions. And inside those brochures uh, that you have received is a donation form. And also, if you wish to contribute uh, before you leave, there is a pass the hat type of donation bucket at the exit door. And if you believe, uh, and what this political action committee stands for, and you want to be a voice in Missoula County's public safety community, please be as generous as you can so this can continue. Thank you all for being here, and now Pat will continue with our program. It's exciting to see everybody here. We're hoping that we will make a difference this year, that we can uh, see candidates that are willing to support the public safety community and everything that we stand for. This year, four candidates filed for the office of sheriff, and three people filed for the uh, the people, or the two seats for justice of the peace. We are a nonpartisan group, and the, the effort here tonight is to give everybody an opportunity to get free publicity and to get to know the public and to present themselves to the public. Well, those candidates that are not here tonight either declined an invitation, 
failed to submit the proper paperwork or simply disregarded the invitation. We sincerely thank the candidates that are here tonight and for their participation. The candidates present tonight for the Office of Je Justice of the Peace are incumbent John Ogden, Judge. And then, of course, uh, we have the uh, uh, Casey Gunther, who is a candidate for JP2. And Casey's going to be running against the incumbent Judge Karen Orzik. And also, as mentioned before, we're going to have uh, RJ Nelson speak briefly about the search and rescue program. Guest candidates for the office are uh, Don Mormon, who is a retired captain for the Missoula County Sheriff's Department, and Brad Giffen, who is currently serving as a lieutenant for the Sheriff's Department. <clears throat> the protocol that we're going to be using tonight is going to go like this. Each candidate is going to be given 15 minutes in which to make their basic presentation, their stance, what they stand for, what they believe in. We've given each candidate, except for the search and rescue, but we've given each candidate three questions. They're going to read each of those questions and then answer them as they go through them um, and as part of our efforts. When they're done with their presentation, they'll briefly say thank you or, or, or however they wish to end it, and then it will be open to the public for general questions. We'll allow up to 10 minutes of questions from the public. Again, this is your forum, your opportunity to get to know the candidates. I uh, notice there's people from the detention center, uh, all walks of life here. Uh, please feel free to get involved and ask questions because it is your future also. We will begin tonight's program with uh, R.J. Nelson and his presentation on the Missoula Search and Rescue Program. R.J.? Thanks, Pat. Um, I'm here tonight to tell everybody a little bit about Search and Rescue. Um, I've got some fans in the crowd. Raise your hand. <laughs> it's Dave and Jeremiah. They're uh, fans of Search and Rescue because um, when they get a call and somebody's out, lost, missing in the woods, they actually physically don't have to go themselves and take care of the problem. So they're two of our biggest fans. For those of you that don't know, and please, if you do know, don't correct me if I get something wrong. Uh, search and Rescue in Missoula County was established in 1959. It is an all-volunteer effort, other than our fearless leaders here. And last year, Search and Rescue volunteers put in over 3,000 hours of volunteer time. And that accounts for missions, training, educational events, uh, public relations events, uh, equipment maintenance, and then the administrative portion of what we need to do. All of our members are citizens of Missoula County, at least 19 years old, with good moral character. I gotta change that. Mostly good moral character. <laughs> and they do pass a background check. It's how thorough it is is subject to question. Um, each member is required to put in at least 36 hours a year, but you can tell from the 3,000 hour number that it's usually over 100 hours a year on average. Um, we meet monthly for membership uh, board and, and training events, and all of our members are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We also require our members to purchase a lot of their own equipment, uh, personal equipment, uh, the clothing, um, electronics, a lot of that stuff that we all use, our folks buy for themselves. So where's the problem? Well, the problem is we've been doing this for so long. I was a uh, little anecdotal thing. I was putting together some uh, um, foam core boards with uh, different things on them about the search and rescue uh, mill levy. Um, they're at a neighborhood council meeting tonight, so they can't be here with us. But if you would imagine, there's these three boards here. Um, one of them had old newspaper articles about search and rescue. Uh, Dave Ball has been involved in the, the program for a long time. And collected a lot of this stuff. And I was reading a newspaper article about how it was in the early 60s and they were kicking off the yearly fundraising. Um, this has all been done by donations for 45 plus years. And as part of that, they were driving their cars up, I think on Waterworks Hill from what they were describing, and turning on the little red lights that Dave and Jeremiah won't let us have anymore. That's another issue we'll talk about later after cookies and coffee. Um, they were expecting to raise four to five thousand dollars in the early 1960s for search and rescue. That's not much less than what search and rescue brought in last year as far as donations. Um, 
prices of things have gone up, the equipment that we need to have, a lot more expensive, a lot more uh, in depth as far as, as the types of activities that are going on in the county, and we're not bringing in much more money than we did 40 years ago. It's becoming an issue. We've been making do with reserve uh, monies that we had set aside um, over the last couple years. But as a board and as a unit, we've looked at that and seen that that is going down. We're not bringing in as much money. We live in Missoula. There's as many or more nonprofits in Missoula per capita as there are in Boston. There are a lot of great things going on in our town. That's one of the nice things about living in Missoula. Unfortunately, as a search and rescue unit, that means that we're in competition with all these other things that are going on. They're very worthwhile, and the community's been very good to us. But we just can't keep up with the technology and the resources that we need to do a good job. Our main goal as a search and rescue unit is to provide the highest professional level of service that we can to the visitors to and the citizens of Missoula County. And that's going to take some money to do it. You guys know it from law enforcement, you know it from the detention center, you just can't do a good job unless you have the tools that you need. We're not asking for Christmas, we're not asking for a bunch of toys to show off and, and polish on the weekend or anything like that. We just need the things to, that, that are required to get the job done. Um, most of you may know that it's been a very busy season for us in search and rescue. Since the beginning of hunting season, we're pushing about 30 calls for service. Um, that's a lot for volunteers. We're averaging about one a week. And when we add in the equipment maintenance, we do our own oil changes and our boat maintenance and the snowmobiles and cleaning the shop and managing maps and computers and all the stuff that we need to do, um, doing our administrative meetings and training at least once a month and then I have to turn around and ask my members, hey, by the way, we need another Saturday from you. We need another couple nights a week so that we can raise the money, so that we can buy the equipment, so we can go and do what we're called to do. We're just at a point where something has to change. And so as a unit, we've decided to approach the Board of County Commissioners to ask that they place on the ballot um, the opportunity for the voters in Missoula County to approve a one half of a mill <laughs> levy for our search and rescue unit. It's authorized by state law to one mill. We felt that that would be um, too much. A half a mill um, would provide us with about $80,000 a year to fund search and rescue, fund training, fund operations, fund equipment, and build a reserve so that we have an unexpected equipment replacement but we're in a position to do that and maintain the level of service that everybody deserves. So what's that going to cost you? That's the big question. One half of a mill in Missoula County, the average home price will say $200,000. I know it's kind of low, but it's just easy math for me. Um, it's going to be a little over $2 a year, which I think uh, given um, what we're asking for and what we're going to do with the money. There's no administrative costs involved in that. Everything goes back into the unit. It, the, our budgets have to be approved by the Board of County Commissioners every year. And once we have our equipment um, needs in place, once we have our vehicles, the boats, the snowmobiles, and those items on a fleet rotation, um, and we have a reserve net, <coughs> Our budget will only reflect what it takes for us to operate for that given year. When you approve something like this as a voter, it's actually up to one half of a mill. That's a maximum. If we submit a budget that doesn't reflect $80,000, then that money is not levied against property owners in Missoula County. Now that's not going to happen right away because we are in a, in a position right now, it's going to take several years for us to get in to shape where it's not going to require that amount of money. But I can guarantee you that we've had long discussions about this, and if the money is not needed, it will not be levied just because it's there. We are committed as a group to being very fiscally responsible and frugal with the funds that we receive. We've demonstrated that over 45 plus years um, in building and maintaining our own equipment. We'll continue to do the same, the same thing with the tax money. 
for those of you that don't know, some of the activities that Search and Rescue is involved in. We do land searches, snowmobile operations. We're Missoula County's only public safety diving team. So anything underwater that goes on, whether it's city or county or what agencies are involved, we're the folks that do that. Um, to demonstrate a need, I'll give you another anecdotal example. We were diving on an evidence search off of uh, Bammon Bridge um, in early January. It was the first or second week of January. And I'm part of the dive team. That's how I got involved in search and rescue. And we started diving. We were looking for some property, and everything was great. It was kind of a sunny day. There's snow and ice out, and the water's kind of cold, but it's not too bad. Um, unfortunately, out of the three of us, we all use our own personal equipment. All three sets of regulators froze during our dives. And what that means is, is what you're breathing out of, the valve freezes open and the, and the air just keeps coming out. So it doesn't give you a lot of time to uh, mess around and get to the surface where you're back to um, being in a more safe situation. What we'd like to be able to do is provide the appropriate type of equipment, the industry standard, the full face mask, um, those types of things to our, our members so that we don't have to spend the three, four, five thousand dollars in gear that it takes to be a part of that dive team. And I think that's, if, if we've got folks that are willing to do the training, willing to, to upkeep that, and to put their own safety at risk to perform some of these duties, I think it's pretty reasonable to expect that we provide them with the appropriate equip equipment to keep them safe. We do, uh, we have a canine team. We do boat operations on uh, swift water and, and standing water. Uh, high and low angle rescue, ELT. Uh, we do the evidence searches, uh, assist law enforcement, mutual aid missions. We've had a couple of those this year. Um, avalanche response, education, tracking and sign cutting, ice rescue, and we do safety for river events. As part of those missions that I talked about that we've conducted since the beginning of hunting season and actually back through the spring, we've had a, and this is actually needs to be way updated. Um, I wrote this in January, January, early February, before I presented to the county commissioners, and it's changed significantly since then. But at that time, we had 11 lost or overdue person events, 17 people total, two evidence searches, uh, downed aircraft parts, in a ditch out by the airport, that was kind of interesting. Um, three swift water missions, uh, a safety mission for the Lewis and Clark reenactors, two mutual aid requests, three dive team events, um, a request from law enforcement to help with an air airplane identification. The educational opportunities include Safe Kids Days, flagship talks, hug a tree programs. Um, we do Fish, Wildlife, and Parks uh, snowmobile groomer uh, training. Um, we assist with snowmobile and avalanche courses, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, and we would really like to expand our hug a tree program, uh, the program that teaches kids what to do if they, they get lost or disoriented in the, in the woods, to, to cover that entire target population so that by the time somebody's in fourth or fifth grade, everybody in Missoula County that's a student has gone through that program. It's expensive and it's a huge undertaking but we think it's that important given the information that we get back from people that are lost. We work with Life Flight, Rural Fire Departments, City Fire, Highway Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, Missoula Police, QRU, Civil Air Patrol, uh, the Air Force Rescue Command Center, Ski Patrol Units, uh, other Western Montana SAR units, and uh, Smoke Jumpers Aerial, Aerial Fire Depot. Um, a proposed budget for that $80,000 would include about 55% for equipment, 25% uh, for a Sealy building fund until we got to the point where we could actually have our own building in Sealy that we could heat and keep our equipment in. Right now we rent a storage unit, kind of like um, when you're moving and you don't have enough place to put all your stuff, you roll the door up and put everything in. That's what we have right now for our cash and equipment in Sealy Lake. Um, that doesn't lend itself towards a quick response in that area. And we just feel that that's unacceptable. The other part is, is that our GPS unit and radios that we have in that area have to be stored at a member's house because they're kind of sensitive to the fluctuation in, in uh, temperatures and moisture and things like that. So it's great if that person's home, but if they're not home, then all of a sudden we have a problem. Um, 
10% for training, 5% for operations, and 5% to meet that reserve fund up to $40,000. So, in a nutshell, we're asking for about $2.14 from each homeowner in Missoula County to fund something that saves lives, is not going to administration, it's going to equipment and right back into the services to Missoula County. We're getting busier, people are getting deeper into the backcountry, they're recreating more. That's why we live in Missoula. That's why people live in Western Montana. That's what we want people to continue to do. We would just like to be in a position to actually respond and give them the level of service that they need. So that in a nutshell is what we're proposing. This will be on the June 6th ballot. Your vote, if you're in favor of this, would be for the search and rescue mill levy. So are there any questions? got to be one. Does this, do you have to come back after a certain amount of years or is this forever? This mill levy would be in perpetuity so it would be there all the time um, and again like I said if it's if it's uh, not needed if that money is not reflected in the budget then it would not be levied against the taxpayer. The question that I've gotten I've done several of these presentations that uh, um, this would be actually the first time I haven't gotten this question, so I'm going to ask it myself and then answer it. That would make it rhetorical, right? Is why don't we charge people? As people go out, they get out in the woods, they do dumb stuff, they ski out of bounds and snowball, snowball. Why don't we charge them? You know, the people that need the help could pay for this. Well, that's all well and good, but there's a couple reasons that that doesn't work. Number one, we don't ever know how many missions we're going to have in here, so it's not a real effective way to budget. Number two, charging and collecting are two different things. It's pretty rare, although on a couple of occasions we have some people that um, could actually afford to pay for their rescue. Um, it's pretty rare that people are in a position to do that. And it's really hard to put a monetary amount on what it costs for volunteers to go out, um, given the risks, to effect a rescue. But the biggest one is, is that people that are lost, overdue, or in a time of need in the backcountry aren't making good decisions. There's a lot of anxiety involved, and the more bad decisions that they make, the harder it is, and the more difficult, and the farther we have to go to get them. If we add in that anxiety of what's this gonna cost me, the call's delayed, we get the information later, it's darker, always this stuff never comes up in the morning <laughs> and generally speaking the weather gets worse I don't know how that I don't know if that's statistically a fact but I'm just gonna say that it always rains when we have something planned <clears throat> so we don't want that anxiety to be added to by what's this gonna cost me because it delays the call and it actually makes it more dangerous and more difficult for our unit to affect the rescue so now I answered my own question are there any other questions or comments? <clears throat> How many volunteers do you have? <laughs> we have about 30 on our roster. Um, currently, we're organized into three squads, two of them here in Missoula and one in, in uh, Sealy Lake. Uh, we have room in our bylaws allows for 36 <laughs> members. Um, so we've got some openings if anybody's not an account county employee already and wants to come out and, and uh, do some search and rescue stuff. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time. I appreciate you being here. I think there's some important things that we're going to hear about tonight. Appreciate being able to go first, Pat. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. We're next going to deal with the Office of Justice of the Peace, and the first speaker tonight from that department is going to be the Honorable Judge Odlin, who is already the incumbent, and of course he has no challengers, which is only appropriate. Judge Odlin. I don't know whether about that no challengers is any good or not. You know, I got this job, and then nobody ran against me, and then I thought, hmm. Is this such a bad job, <laughs> or am I doing a good job? You know, I don't know. I hope it's a good job. 
Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been married for 40 years, and I thought that's quite an accomplishment being in law enforcement for 23 years. Got uh, two young sons in, uh, well, one of them's not too young anymore. Two sons in the city police department, and I'm awful proud of those guys. And so I think that I uh, am pretty well involved with the law enforcement community and the law in Missoula. Uh, I know the judge is supposed to be blind, but we're not blind all the time. You know, we see some things going on. Uh, just to give you a little background about Justice Court, and, and like I say, no one running against me, so I'm not going to talk very long. I'm going to let these guys that are running talk. Uh, we handle about 20,000 cases in, in Justice Court. Now, that doesn't mean that we physically, as a judge, handle 20,000 cases, but there's 20,000 cases go through our courts. That's civil cases, misdemeanor cases, uh, and criminal cases. On misdemeanor cases, we can handle those from start to finish. We take them from the plea all the way through a jury trial if necessary. On a felony case, somebody comes in on a felony that the county attorney has charged and will uh, read them the complaint, ask them if they want an attorney, get them an attorney, set a preliminary hearing, and they move on to district court. Okay? So we don't actually handle any cases, but it's still a lot of cases going through the court. And Casey might not know all of this, so I thought I'd better help him here a little bit. Um, <laughs> we handle all misdemeanor cases for fish and game, uh, highway patrol, Department of Transportation, and the Sheriff's Office. So we, uh, we see a lot of different officers, and we see them all the time. And uh, I think Missoula County is pretty lucky. We've got some real good ones. Uh, I think that uh, that's pretty much about me. I don't think that I need to spend a lot of time about that. Um, they gave us some questions that I'm supposed to answer. In your perspective, what are the most important issues now facing Justice Court? I think probably, and I, I want to apologize, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or hurt anybody's feelings here, but I think the Justice Court has to handle all cases. I don't think that we can focus on one, and I'm not trying to make light on domestic violence, believe me, but right now we are getting so that we are focused on domestic violence did you read the paper this morning? DUI killed two people. If you look back, the DUIs are killing a lot more people than we are with domestic violence. But we've got a handle on domestic violence because we have been there. We're working on it, and we're working on it now. But I think that we need to move some of our money and our resources towards the DUIs and the accidents. There's more economic loss in the state of Montana in accidents than there is in property crimes. A lot of people probably don't know that either. But there is. So it's an important situation. And just look at the papers. Look at, it wasn't too long ago that we got the distinction of being the number one in the nation in Montana for drunk driving. Okay? I think we need to be in all of those areas. Drunk driving, domestic violence, everywhere. But I don't think that we need to focus in on one particular court. And we're taught there's talk in Missoula County about a domestic violence court, and I don't know that we need that. What happened to a drunk driving court? I don't know. And I, but I think that's a real a real problem and a real important issue that we need to look at and we need to face as a community. These kind of things are going on. And like I say, I am not by any means making light of domestic violence. I was on the bandwagon with domestic violence from the very start, but when I was on a highway patrol and I answered a lot of calls for assistance as backup officer for domestic violence. So I've seen what I can do, and it's not good. But going to somebody's house and telling them, I'm sorry, but your son or daughter has been killed by a drunk driver is not good either. And I think that we need to start working that way. I think we need to start working on those, those issues. The increasing number of arrests, citations, and orders of protection generated is increasing the caseloads. How do you feel are ways to more efficiently handle or streamline the system? We have a system in Missoula County, and we're fortunate in Missoula County, we have an intern system, which is young attorneys that come out of the uh, law school, third year law students. 
and they prosecute a lot of cases that are handled by these agencies that I just talked about. And if it wasn't for those interns, a lot of these cases wouldn't be prosecuted. And right now, there's six interns trying to handle the work of probably 10 or 15 interns. I think to streamline the system, we need more interns. And probably somewhere down the road, I'd say probably in the next two or three years, we're going to need a third judge because of this caseload. And the reason that I say about the more of the other judge is because if we start losing cases, and I'm talking about these guys that are making these arrests are losing cases because we can't get them to trial within six months, then I think we need more judges. And I think it's going to be coming. Right now, if I schedule a jury trial in a day, I schedule four. Well, some of those are going to go away. Some of them are going to plea bargain out. Some are going to settle. And we might end up with one. There's days that we end up with two and three, and I get some judges in to handle them. But I think that that's coming, and I, and we a lot of times we'll have the, the uh, county attorney's office come down and say, hey, we can't do this case because you've got three cases scheduled for the same attorney. Well, I didn't schedule it, but I mean that's all the attorneys have got. So I think we need more interns. I think that would streamline the system, and like I say, another judge. <clears throat> and the last question: As a judge, what issues do you see that need to be addressed regarding the performance? and efficiency of other local branches of the criminal justice system, i.e. sheriff, police, county attorney, probation, and parole. I think that all of these systems are working and doing the best they can with what they got. And I think they're doing a real good job. Believe me, they're doing a good job. For those of you that might not be in law enforcement, I can tell you that these guys are hard working. And they're out doing a lot of things that don't make the paper. And you don't see it on TV, but they do a lot of work. And we see it through the court, because everything they do comes through the court system one way or the other. The county attorney's office, it's not Fred's fault that he doesn't have the interns. It's just that he doesn't have the money to have the interns. These people cost money. And right now, there's another disparity. I think our interns, if I'm not mistaken, I think that our interns in the county are paid $9 an hour and they're paid $15 an hour at the city. Guess what, folks? Those people are going over to the city. They're not coming to the county. <clears throat> and so, like I say, I think that we, need, that we need some help there. And I don't know that there's anything as a group that we could do right away, except maybe start working and looking for, or if Mad sends you a letter, send them some money. I think that was a great part of that sentence that I saw in the paper this morning, that a mother asked for $21 to be sent to Mad on her son's birthday, the one who was killed. I think that was great. But maybe get involved in those kind of things and help out. I don't know that we can do anything with the budget and with the interns, but we're going to have to. And there's a lot of things coming up this year, this time on the on initiatives. Ballot's going to be jammed with them. RJ is just one. There's going to be quite a few. Justice Court's not asking for any money. You know, we take in quite a bit, but we don't ask for any money. Okay? And we, I, will do whatever it is I can do to keep everything on an even keel. But it's tough sometimes. It's tough sometimes. So thank you for this opportunity. And if anybody has any questions, I know it's quick. But I would rather have you listen to these guys that are running for office and have got competition than to me. Anybody have any questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Lake, I want yes. What, um, you mentioned the possibility of a third, uh, a third judge. Uh, what are the requirements right now of a speed trial? Is it six months? Six months. Six months. We have to bring the case to court, bring it to trial within six months. Unless, unless there's a waiver signed? Unless there's a waiver, a speedy trial signed, or there's something that the defendant has done to slow down the process, okay? If the defendant, we had to get a warrant to get the defendant to come in, uh, the warrant, or uh, we had to, uh, the defense attorney didn't have all their things right and ready to go, and so we had to continue it. We continue it for the defense in the 180 days plays out a little bit longer. 
But it's tough sometimes to get them in in 180 days. You know, you guys want vacations and stuff, you know, and you want to go to training and stuff. It's tough. I mean, my clerks have a, just a whale of a juggling act. One of the things that I ran on when I came into office 12 years ago, because as a highway patrolman, I had given up a lot of vacation time and a lot of days off going to court on my days off. And I asked the, then Judge Stevens, I said, why do we have to have the trials on my day off all the time? She said, well, that's the way the schedule reads. I said, okay, how about if we start having trials on Saturday and Sunday? No, that's my day off. <laughs> Gee whiz. You know, so I work, I try, and my clerks try, very, very hard to stay off of days off. I'm sorry, sometimes I have to get fill out the daylight. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But you know, we can only balance so much. And if I can keep it off his day off, I think I've done something. So, and then we have to balance that. We have to balance that with courtroom time. We have to balance that with the defense attorney, prosecuting attorney, and sometimes it gets tough. And like I say, I'm not advocating right now we're going to need the third judge tomorrow. And in fact, until we have a remodel at the courthouse, we're not going to have, we don't have room. You know, we just don't have room. Those of you that have been in the courthouse for a while, part of our office is around the third floor, and our civil department's on the second floor. Kind of like what the county attorney was for a while, because our departments are just growing by leaps and bounds. Any other questions? Yes, sir. John, what is your opinion on going to maybe a night court as your third judge? We've talked about that. The only problem with there again is with attorneys. How are you going to get the county attorney there, or can you? Can you get the public defenders to show up trial-wise? You know, we could probably do appearances and things like that, and I think that, that might be a, an option. And at one time, we had looked at that space downstairs right there by the PDX, where we've got those um, mediation rooms now. We talked about maybe putting a courtroom in there just for that reason to have night court. We see public defenders all night long. What's that? We see public defenders all night long. Yeah. yeah, well, I know. I know. But, I mean, when we set them into trial and say, okay, we're going to have trials, you know, I, I don't imagine you can probably, you can probably count on one hand how many county attorneys you've seen out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying anything bad against county attorneys because they're hard working and they do a great job. But, I mean, just having the attorneys, I think, might be a problem. But... I mean, we, uh, I don't think that I am opposed to doing night court. It would hurt me if my feelings a bit. <coughs> and we may end up doing that. But trials, I don't think we can do. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next candidate is Casey Gunther. He is running for JP2 court against uh, the incumbent, uh, Karen Orzik, who is not here tonight. Casey has been a police officer for 22 years, 21 years, and he's working currently as a school resource officer within uh, CS Porter and Middle Hill. Okay. Casey, the floor is yours. Well, I had a speech prepared for about 93 minutes, but I think after the judge, I'll cut it to about seven. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been born and raised in Missoula, uh, resident all my life, 48 years, uh, raised in a very loving and supportive family, uh, very blessed. And I have four children. Uh, my oldest is 20, Mitch, he's down in Florida. Uh, Mike, he's a junior over at Sentinel, he's 17. My, or Marty is 15 and he's a freshman at Sentinel. And then my daughter, she's the youngest, she's 10, and she's in fourth grade at Franklin. They keep me pretty busy. But I am so blessed that I have no, I had no problems with my kids as they've grown up. And I've been very fortunate. And one of the things I always told my kids as they grew up, that if an officer ever happens to call me out of courtesy or professionalism, um, that I would ask the officer to write them every ticket they could. <laughs> My oldest one got a speeding ticket with the sheriff's office one day, and I never got a call. But he came home and he says, Dad, guess what? I got something to tell you. This is what's up. And I got a speeding ticket. Really? So he 
went on to explain what happened and how fast he was going. And so I said, well, you're going to have to take care of it. So I went up to the court with him and I was hoping the judge at the time wouldn't recognize who I was. And I kind of sit back in the back seat, just kind of trying to blend in with the paneling on the wall. And of course, my son walked up after being summoned to come up to the bench. And he turned around and he said, Come on, Dad. <laughs> of course, being the supportive dad that I am, but not the dad to be there to get him out of trouble, I said, you go ahead and you need to go take care of that. So he did. My second one, my second oldest, Mike, he always kind of had a chip on his shoulder. He always was kind of upset about police officers. And, you know, he just, he heard from his friends how bad police officers were and so on and so forth. And so one night I got a call about 3.30 in the morning and it was reference Mike because he's out past curfew. And I told the officer who is, is within our Missoula City Police Department, I hope you're right. The officer was very junior to how many years I've had in the department and he said, excuse me, what? And I said, I hope you're right. I explained that that officer had no idea how much he'd be helping my son and I. And so he wrote him. He ended up bringing him home at about 4.30 in the morning, and he had a whole different attitude towards police officers. It changed. My kids, I'm very blessed. They've had some lessons, but they're, uh, they're very responsible and they're productive. I've been with the Missoula City Police Department for 21 years. Uh, 10 of those years I spent in the schools, starting the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, currently, I'm a school resource officer in C.S. Porter, Meadow Hill and the five feeder schools for those two schools in which I, I work with the fifth grade kids and uh, go to the fifth grades and talk about three lessons. Choice is peer pressure and self-esteem and try to help them be stronger in who they are and spend some time with them. I provide mentoring and uh, teaching in the classrooms and some law enforcement as it's needed. I'm a resource for the schools. I get calls from the parents. They're probably give me a cell phone. So. Sometimes the kids don't like how much in touch I am with their parents, but nevertheless, it works out pretty good. Um, I've been talking about running for Justice of the Peace for about 10 years, uh, kicking the idea around with my parents and my friends. Um, I'm just surprised that 10 years is already here. Uh, I actually was waiting for the Honorable Judge John Odlin to retire. Um, and I inquired to see how close that was, but it wasn't close enough. <laughs> no disrespect, Your Honor. <laughs> um, as, as I inquired, I, um, I had quite a bit of, of support. That the timing would be good to do it right now. Um, the, more I, the more time goes on, the more excited I get. Uh, I've sat down with Judge Odlin, we've talked about things, and when I get to the three questions, I'll talk about some of those visits. Um, I think my reputation precedes me that I'm not filing for this position looking for authority or looking for a position to display being the, the, the head chief of something. I'm filing for this position simply because, for the same reason I filed for being a police officer, and that was to help people out. I see this opportunity that I can bring in. I'll bring in honesty. I'm nervous. Mike, could you give me a drink of water? By the way, this is my son, Mike, the one that I talked about with the curfew. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'll pay for it when I go home. I'll bring in honesty, I'll bring in fairness, and I'll bring in respect. If I'm voted into that position. Respect for everybody. And consistency. I will be consistent. I'll issue your appropriate penalties for whatever the crimes that, that come in. And one of the resources I'm going to depend on a lot is Judge Odlin because he's been there for so many years and he's been he's been through it and he's built up a good reputation. My goal is to make those um, justice of the peace, uh, both those positions, on a balanced level, so that people know what to expect and that both sides are, are even as much as they can be. I mean, personalities play into it, but 
you know what? You can make it pretty even, especially if you have two people who are willing to work with each other, <clears throat> which I believe we are, if I cut the jokes out about it. <clears throat> <clears throat> we have a good relationship. Um, I have my pamphlets. I brought them here tonight. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into everything that I've done, but they are listed uh, inside the cover. But um, one of the things that um, I will mention that the judge and I had talked about is when a person is, is given some kind of a monetary fine and that person either fails to stay in touch with the court or they refuse to stay in touch with the court, whichever, whatever the balance is that is owed is turned over to collections. That does quite a lot of things. The first thing it does, and the judge brought this up, it doubles their fine overnight. So they can't even hardly buy a toothbrush on time. The other thing it does is it keeps someone from going to jail and we, the taxpayers, have to pay $75 a day. The other thing it prevents is the person losing their job and then we don't get anything. So the county, us taxpayers, we're out $75 a day. And the fines still aren't paid. So it's a lose-lose. I like the idea of turning it over to collections. The fines double overnight. When collections collects that money, they not only get their half because they double it, but we get our half also. And that's the way the county gets back their money. You know, there's times when people need to be put in jail. But there's a time when people don't need to be put in jail to get the point across or to achieve the goal. And that's one of the things that I really want to work closely with the judge that's in there now. Because, you know, jail is just another option. We have a lot of options. You have the misdemeanor uh, probation. You have community service. We have, you know, jail if it needs to be. We also have collections. And what a great tool that is. I vow that I will save the county money. That's one way. The judgeship is a full-time position. I vow that I will occupy that position full-time. Minus vacations or, um, you know, vacation times or, you know, emergencies that come up. But I vow to be there full-time for the county of Missoula, for the citizens of Missoula. And not only the citizens from Missoula, but a lot of us have friends that are out of state, out of town, and come in to visit us. I'll also represent them. I'll represent fairness. Fairness for everybody. Uh, I thought that I won't let the power get to me or the, the perceived power. Uh, that's not why I'm in there. I'm in there to make a difference. I'm in there to bring some changes, good changes. I'm going to read the three questions and I'll answer those and I'll get into some questions and answers. It says, in your perspective, what are the most important issues now facing justice court? One of the things that I brought up with the judge was the DUIs, the repeat DUIs. And as we spoke about them, and I've had a lot of people, I have a lot of friends working in law enforcement, myself, everyone is concerned about repeat DUIs. And I agree with the judge, with the domestic disturbances, assaults, partner family assaults, those are important issues. But for some reason, we sure have a lot of repeat DUIs out there. And that was one of my concerns, and that's what I went to the judge with. And I said, I am very concerned about this. What can we do? And he, in talking, I have encouragement, because as we spoke, and I won't tell you what, what he kind of lined out, but there are some laws that are coming up. And I think that we're going to be able to impose some very stiff penalties that will make some changes <coughs> about the repeat DUIs that we see, which will be a relief to all of us. You know, those three boys, they went through uh, the school that I have, and to see their names in the paper, and to see the one this morning in the newspaper, you know, that's tragic. I think there's some penalties out there. I think we have some room that we can do some things if we have the laws that will back us up in the courts. You know, as a justice of the peace, being a judge is just, you just don't do whatever you want. The judge has to act within the laws that are given to us. And I vow I will do that. 
And I think our laws are coming that we're going to be able to make some changes with reference to DUIs. And that'll be awesome. <coughs> You know, one time I had a kid, he, he looked at me, you know, and I get this question quite a lot in the schools that I teach. And they say, Casey, if tobacco is so dangerous, why, does, why is it still being sold? Why is it still being made? And I, and I explained to him right up front that, you know what, the owners of tobacco companies aren't sitting here or standing here looking in your eyes of our young people. Because when you look in the eyes of these young people, in the eyes of a kid, if it doesn't get to your heart, I don't know what will. We need to take care of our kids. And DUIs is one that I vow I will do that. Not only for our kids, but for, for the adults too. Because I think every one of us has probably been victim to some kind of a, a, a tragic incident that's happened when someone's been driving and drinking, drinking and driving. Second question, with the increasing number of arrests, citations, and orders of protection generating ever-increasing caseloads, case do you feel there are ways uh, to more efficiently handle or streamline the system? If so, how? You know, the judge pretty much answered that question. We talked about it. Uh, more county interns. Uh, you know, he didn't mention the, the wage difference. Maybe I'll stay with the city and go work as an intern. <laughs> Um, you know, you run into problems where, you know, money is a, a problem. You know, in the county courthouse, you don't have room for another judge. I know that, you know, the judges talked about something, you know, they, they have three, four, five cases that are scheduled in one day. And sometimes two of those will go to trial, so you bring in a sub judge, correct? To handle those cases. But the county courthouse really doesn't have the room. You know, when they build that new building, the law enforcement building, then hopefully there'll be some more room. But with more room comes more support. And then you're talking about more attorneys. You're talking about more interns. And you're talking about a whole lot of things. So the prices just increase. But as it is now, and talking about getting you know trials, uh, a speedy trial, you know, being an law enforcement officer or anyone that's that's in the court system if you're a victim, you certainly don't want things to be canceled or, or dropped because it can't go to court. And I believe that there's people that understand that and I believe that that will be prevented from happening because I know we have a lot of people who care in the courthouse, we have people who care in the county attorney's office, and as the judge said, those people are trying to work their hearts out, trying to do a good job. So I'm sure that those things will be met as time goes on. Uh, it says, as judge, third question, what issues do you see that need to be addressed regarding the performance and efficiency of other local branches of the criminal justice system, the sheriff, the police, the county attorney, the probation and parole? One thing I'd like to add on there is the city judge, municipal judge. I believe that we all need to work together. It's a team ship in trying to make things run more efficiently. You know, being justice of the peace isn't just in my view, it's not a place of just kind of being your own person and doing your own thing. There's a lot of people to work with. You know, if the sheriff comes to me and says, there's no room in the jail, don't put anybody in jail. I'm not going to put anybody in jail unless I call them and ask them. Now, if there's somebody who really needs to be in jail, maybe there's someone else we can release. Because if there's no room in the jail and we really have someone that needs to be in there that can't be turned loose, then maybe there's some other options. And that's where it's working together, not just me doing my own thing. It's not about me. It's not about me doing my own thing. It's about working together so that things flow in the ways that they're supposed to flow. One of the other things I vow is with the sheriff's deputies, and of course, Judge, I knew that you guys handled everything the city did. Which leaves everything. <laughs> but I didn't realize the uh, motor, what did you say? Motor transport. Motor transport. I didn't realize. I didn't even think about those guys. A lot of things. Um, I vow that for the, for the officers, that the office will be open, phone calls, uh, that the trials won't be uh, scheduled on days off on vacation times, 
you know, as the judge said, I'm sure that sometimes, you know, a, a mistake may be made, but that's not the precedent. That's not, that's not the norm. Uh, officers, you know, they, they put their lives on the line. There's a lot of stress. Their time off is a time for them to unwind. I had the privilege to call the sheriff's office last Friday because I figured I better get down there and know some of those, or let those, some of those new guys get to know me. And ended up writing with two different deputies, and the first deputy ended up arresting a guy for uh, felony drugs. So we went back to the, we only got, I mean, we didn't hardly get away from the station. And so I ended up writing with another deputy, and we only got a few blocks away from, from the county, and we got a call at Seal Lake for a domestic. And so we went driving up there and a couple of reserves and we're in another car and you know, I, it was just another reminder because I've been in schools for so long working with the kids that you know, it's stressful on the streets and that's one thing I vow is not to do that to the officers. Um, I think I pretty much answered. County Attorney's Office, working with the County Attorney's Office, I mean, you know, what would you do without all the interns or the county attorneys? You know, they got so many cases and they were working out plea bargains. Um, you know, there's no way two justices of peace could handle all the calls or all the, all the cases. You know, thankfully you have people that are able to plea bargain things out so that there's room for the new ones coming in. And that's one thing about that position that things don't just stop. Holidays come and things still, the, the, the officers still get the calls. There's still things that come in. There's still cases that are made. Uh, working with probation and parole, you know, and no different. Working with probation and parole and, you know, and helping, I look at this position as just being able to, to make a difference, being able to make some changes, and like I said, help, help things flow a lot more smoothly. Being approachable, um, I'm no different than anybody else. There's two things that won't change if I'm elected, I guarantee it. That's my first name and my last name. Nothing else will change. Those two things for sure. Any questions? <coughs> Comments? I just, I guess, have an admonishment the fact that uh, as a deputy in Missoula County, one of the, the funnest things um, that I get to experience is uh, when I'm on a traffic stop. Um, I'll even go back a little further. I grew up in a house of respect, um, respecting my parents, brought up that way. And um, when, when I'm on a traffic stop, <coughs> There are several times when people will say, oh, this is, um, I'll just go talk to a certain judge and um, this will just all go away. And then I'll get to say, no, if you see the star here, I work for the county. And just to have them look at me and go, um, is this that Judge Odlin guy? <laughs> say, exactly. And I'll say, well, that guy hates me. <laughs> well, it's not that, and then I'll get to tell them that it's not the fact that the judge hates you. It's that he's holding you accountable for your actions. And so I guess I, I've known you for a long time, and, and um, I guess I would just say that, you know, that, you know, have my, my support, the fact that uh, holding people accountable for their actions is, uh, is a good thing. You know, Tony, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, last Friday I called the Shores, actually I called 911 and asked them if, um, you know, told them who I was, and of course they knew it anyway, because it's some color ID thing. And I told them I'd like to uh, go ride with the deputy, because like I said, I don't know any of the new guys. And, you know, I had to, I had to make the call to open up those doors. And that's okay, because that's the way it needs to be done. I need to take the initiative. But the reason why I bring that up is because I say I'm approachable. Wouldn't it be a kick? And I heard this happen when Judge Clark went down. Judge Clark was riding with an officer, one of the city officers. And Judge Clark was sitting in the front seat. And the officer made an arrest, put the guy in the back seat. And as the guy is sitting there and the doors are closed and the officer is sitting in the driver's seat, Judge Clark is sitting in the front seat. The guy is sitting in the back seat. He said, ah, you're a city officer, right? The officer says, yes. He says, ah, oh, I have to go see Judge Clark, right? The officer says, yes. Oh, that's OK. He'll let me go. <laughs> Judge Clark, he turned, he turned and looked at the guy, and he said, we're having court right now. <laughs> so Tony, 
I don't need to make those calls if I'm voting in November. That would be awesome to have the invitation to come out and ride. And, and it's a way to stay in touch. You know, I don't know that, you know, I mean, it's a difference between being justice of the peace from being an officer. And, you know, it's kind of funny because Friday night I was more in the officer mode than I was a judge mode because I'm not used to being a judge. And so when I went on the ride and we went to that domestic, the officer and I were talking about officer stuff and officer caution, and we never worked with each other. In fact, I didn't go to work at all. I just went to kind of let him know who I am and what I stand for. And then we're talking about, you know, officer stuff and backing up and what we expect and what we do. And it was awesome. Because when I got in, I got to play too. Probably one of the frustrating parts would be being a judge. I mean, they're going to take my gun away from me when I, if I get elected. <laughs> and, you know, it would be hard not to do the cop thing, you know, and it's kind of caught in between. And then Saturday or Friday night, one of the officers said, what do you think of the procedure? And I'm still bouncing between, <laughs> between police and you know, the judge. And I said, what procedure? <laughs> and he says, what do you think about the procedure, about the way we searched his car? I got his consent first. And he says, oh, yeah, that. He was going back to, what do you think as a judge? I said, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> and I told, uh, I got to speak at the uh, Sheriff's Association meeting not too long ago. And, you know, I told him, I said, don't forget I'm still a police officer if I ever get voted in judge. You know, and I always wondered, you know, which judges allowed the guns, you know, to carry the gun in the courtroom. And I said, I assure you that, um, you know, that was one of my main concerns and that your guns will always be welcome in my courtroom. But just don't start shooting in my direction. That's all I ask. <laughs> because I may have to buy a gun. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Come on, don't make this easy. <laughs> Anybody? Judge? Thank you very much. Before we do, the last few candidates are running for the office of Sheriff for Missoula County. And we're going to do a coin toss so we know who's going to be up first. Lieutenant Brad Giffen, would you call the coin, please? It's still. Don Mormon will be our next speaker. Please take a five minute break and then we'll come back and finish up. Thanks for your patience. I'd like to introduce to you Don Mormon, who was a former captain for Missoula County Sheriff's Department. He worked for the Sheriff's Department for approximately 26 years, not quite 27. Was it 27? 28 and a half, I think. Oh, I wouldn't even call it. Excuse me. And uh, Don is going to be our first speaker for the Sheriff's Department candidate tonight. And Don, the floor is yours. Thank you. Total law enforcement experience, about 30 years. Why am I here? I heard that today when I walked in the door. Well, you know, first of all, I paid 300 and some bucks to the clerk in elections for the opportunity to address this group. <laughs> and I'm gonna get my money's worth, folks. <laughs> the PAC sent out a questionnaire, and this questionnaire said, why are you running? I sat down and I wrote a great answer. I thought it was a great answer, and then I gave it to my wife, of, of my bride of 33 years, and uh, she says, that's political rhetoric. <laughs> and I said, okay, why are you running? Just put down there why you're running. And I, you know, after I'd been gone for two years from the department, I got to think of why am I running? What am I doing here? And I come to the conclusion that Missoula County Sheriff's Department gave me a hell of a lot of fun. Missoula County Sheriff's Department gave me a life, it gave me a career, it gave me a lot of rewards. It paid for my kids' education, and it, I mean, I enjoyed it. And the biggest thing was I enjoyed working with everybody here. And I want to continue that, but the biggest thing I believe is that I want everybody that presently works at the Missoula County Sheriff's Department to have the same experience, enjoyable experience that I had, and that possibly the experience of 30 years and the training will give me the opportunity to lead the department. And basically, that's what I'm doing here. My administration will emphasize people. 
you cannot have good law enforcement without having the people to do the job. The detention center, the auxiliaries, the sheriff's department, the detectives, all the divisions. It's the people that make the department. <clears throat> Everyone has a right and a duty to speak up. Everybody's ideas are valuable. Everybody deserves an open door policy without retribution. Consistent policies and application the same is important, it's tremendously important for good morale. Consistent policies, everyone deserves quick resolutions to problems, internal problems within the department. Fair, thorough investigations that do not take forever. Judgment is not before investigation. Folks, I think it's over five years well, let's just say, I believe the Missoula County Sheriff's Department needs a use of force policy. I know it hasn't had one for over five years. And it needs a working RMS, a new one. And I don't believe that's working. I believe that the Missoula County Sheriff's Department has some of the best, if not the best personnel in the state. And I'm not just talking deputies, I'm talking detention, I'm talking support staff, I'm talking about people that work their fingers to the bone, I mean really have worked for years, I've seen it, I observed it, I've lived with it. I believe that tools and equipment can be purchased, maybe if I deserve to be downgraded in my career is because I went after too much tools and equipment. That was my job, I did it. Basically what I'm saying is, Missoula County Sheriff's Department, I believe needs to go back to participatory management. A management where everybody gets to a say in what's going on, how it's going on where people in the upper levels listen to what is needed. That we need to get to problem solving policing. They used to call it community oriented policing, but for law enforcement it's problem solving. Where the problems are solved on the street, identified on the street, the sergeants are involved in running their, their job, doing their job. Problems and solutions. And how to get there has got to be done at the level where the problems are at. It's not top-down management. Now, I know I'm not the sharpest tack in the box. I know I'm not the smartest guy here. The only reason why I may be here or that I think I can lead the department is because I have experience and training. I believe that everyone has to contribute. Everybody's got to work together to do the job. I cannot do the job. I wouldn't want to try to do the job myself. That's not the point. The point is that everybody does their job. Management has to know what their job is, and they provide the tools and the environment to do them. Management means being enabling everybody to do their job. Management's job is to plan, direct, coordinate, and manage change. Change is every day. Management's job is the environmental and the tools, and we're back to the basic tool, and the basic tool is the people that work there. Because when we have the basic tools, when it's a good department, when the morale is high, when people are working, that means we are able to do the service for the people. The health of everybody is important. Fair discipline, no judgment before investigations. Progressive discipline consistent with the violation with priority of correcting negative behavior and preventing future, future misbehavior. But it also has rehabilitation and retention. The retention of officers, the retention of detention officers. I really believe that the people 
are most able when they have 10 to 20 to 30 years on and you don't want to lose those old people. I cannot make the department great. I can lead the department to greatness. You folks that work there are the department. You make the department great. You are the department. I will solicit your input. You will not live in fear when you suggest things. I expect you to criticize me and tell me when I make a mistake. The same thing is true. I expect to do the same thing for you, with you, to you. You know, people make mistakes for a number of reasons, but probably 45% of the time they say it's lack of training. And that's not the officer's fault. That's not the detention officer's fault. That's not, it's whose? It's the department's fault. 45% lack of training, 45% lack of experience. And that again is not the officer's fault. Now you're down to 5% which is judgment. And that judgment is things like common sense. People make mistakes and you have to live with that. Basically, the other 5% is sins of omission or commission if I may use that. That's where somebody was lazy and didn't get the job done or didn't want to do the job or wanted to screw it up. That doesn't happen, folks. And you can't step on people when they make mistakes that aren't the 5% sins of omission. And you're going to have to, you're going to have to have some kind of discipline on the people with the 5% that make judgment mistakes. But as long as it's fair and reasonable, that's it. I truly believe that you folks within the department will determine who the next sheriff is, who you want to be your leader. I'll be frank with you. If I don't have the department support, I don't want to be the leader because I don't want to try and pull a boat by myself. Basically, you are the department. And if you want, I would like to serve you as your leader. Basically, that's the opening. In your perspective, what are the most important issues and challenging faces, challenges facing the Sheriff's Department now and in the future? I believe the first one is lack of public support. I believe that we, the department, at least on the enforcement side as opposed to the detention side, has not been growing. There are serious considerations of shrinkage. I can see that annexation is taking over areas, a loss of population. Basically, I believe that a lot of it can be mitigated and or reversed through PR, through everybody knowing what the Sheriff's Department does. I don't know that we've done a good job of selling it. Each individual officer selling it. What I'm saying is the jail does a heck of a job. It's got all these people there. We have warrants officers or warrants duties inside the county. We serve civil papers inside the county. We do traffic in, I'm sorry, inside the city. We do all these things for the people of Missoula. And yet I don't know that we are selling ourselves, shall we say, because basically we are selling ourselves, we must sell a service. And we are providing that service, but we must sell ourselves, and we must give that service. Basically your professionalism, service, and integrity, and that's the basis for the department. If you are professional, if you, you know, if you're not mean, if you do not use profanity, if you act professional, look professional, people accept you are professional. So basically, I think we need to work on that, and I think that would be the biggest. 
We have problems with the jail. We have problems with the budget. We have problems with. I think they're probably secondary because if we have the support of the people who are calling us, giving us information, who are helping us, assisting us, who are passing the mill levy for search and rescue, who are, we are going to eventually be able to, if we need the money, pass the mill levy also, if we need it. If elected to the position of sheriff, how would you respond to specific issues such as low morale, operational funding, unification of divisions, patrol, detective jail, and interaction with other local law enforcement agencies? I guess I already talked about low morale, and the answer there is to listen, to communicate, to solicit and accept ideas from everybody to do our best to come to consensus, not top-down management. You know, so many, I shouldn't say so many times, maybe as a captain I did a couple memos that were thrown away three days later and forgotten about. That's top-down management. The question may be whether I was told to or not beside the point. The point is I knew that was gonna get thrown away. But the idea is to get everybody, whether it's the jail, to sit down, what do we got, where are we going, how are we going to get there? And you guys have the answers. You're pros. The people in the jail, you know, I was talking to somebody that had over 20 years on, maybe a lot more than 20 years here a little while ago, had some heck of a good, bunch of good ideas for cost saving. Well, I'll get into that later. Listen, communicate, accept ideas from each other, empower the individuals, empower the sergeants. Participatory management again. Problem solving policing, where everybody gets together with the public and identifies what their problems are and tries to actually solve it. Getting back to them, you know, let them know what we're doing. Yeah, people say about funding, well, you know, I guess I cannot speak right now. I can tell you that I will audit. I don't mean actually hire an auditor. I'm talking about financially. Look at the books. Look at what the jail is running at. Look at what patrol is running at. Look at, look at our car budget. Look at, look at, look at. With the idea that you can either, you know, you got, first you got to look at cost cutting. You got to look at the programs you either can eliminate or you need to add or should add. But basically, you need to go through all those steps with the people to determine where your budget is, where you want it to go to, and you need to decide how you're going to get there. There's always uh, alternatives and exceptions. You always got cost saving ideas, cost cutting ideas, and you gotta listen to the people. If you need to, I guess you call the outside consultants or you get outside personnel if you need to. Basically, that's where you're at. I would not uh, cement myself down to anything in that area at the present time. Unification of the vision. Well, I guess you're, Basically, if I can say that I know that people who have treated other people opposite of the golden rule, and the golden rule, you know, treat other people like you'd like to be treated, whether they live in, work in that division, or this division, or this detention division, treated them like second class citizens, and that is pathetic and it's got to stop. Everybody's got worth, everybody's got value. Everybody deserves to be treated with the same respect and dignity that all humans have, whether you're working on the street or whether you're talking to an inmate or whether you're talking to a coworker. I wasn't one for chewing on people. I'm sorry, it didn't fit me. But I was always one that wanted to find out why. Was it a lack of training problem? Was it a lack of, was it our fault for not giving you policy or procedures or direction? You know, that's why I want to find out what happened or why it's happening so we can identify it so it ain't going to happen again so we can change that behavior. That's the idea because we, basically we want that guy to be live here and be happy so he can, after 30 years, say goodbye, say la vie. 
everyone working together is the answer. And you have to foster that from the top down and you get literally give directions. I said dig dignity and respect, look and act professional. The basics, both from the top and down, are the integrity, the service, and the professionalism. What you say you do, you do it. If you can't do it, you explain why you didn't do it. Simple. I guess it's back to the golden rule again. I've seen the bad times. I've seen all under different administrations. I've seen bad times. I know what happens. I know, what, shall we say, that when people are hiding because they are not happy, they have low morale, I shouldn't use the word hiding, they're staying under the radar, that they may not be making all the stops they could or should, that they may not be because they don't want the spotlight on too much. You know, the fear, as opposed to success, they're more worried about the fear of getting chewed out. And that takes care of itself with morale. I could stand here and I could say, well, I'm going to change the department's organization by and make everything better. And the answer to that, folks, is, yeah, I got some ideas. I really like the geopolitical organizational model. And I could sit and talk and explain to you and how it works and everything, but I won't because I don't know that it's right. And maybe someday if I am sheriff, I will discuss it with you and I will direct, we will we'll take a look at it. But I'm not gonna force things down your throat, you know? You could say everybody, you know, we got this <laughs> geopolitical says you, you uh, got your group of people and you put them in your zones and you work up and everybody is responsible for those cases in those zones and detectives work are assigned to that group and you got a major case unit and I could go through all that, but the side point. The point is, is that you can talk about an allocation, resource allocation model, you can talk talking about a collective model. We're doing an eclectic model, I, I would suggest right now, where you've got so many people doing these jobs, these jobs, these jobs, and then you decide you need a SWAT team over here, you need these people to do this, you need these, and pretty soon you don't have enough people on the street. Well, basically, it comes back down to your local, your people, and you gotta have safety first. You gotta get the job done, it's gotta be done safe, or we can't help the public. And last but not least, we should be having fun. Interaction with local law and criminal justice agencies. I expect everybody to interact. I'm talking about jailers, I'm detention officers. I grew up in the jail. I was a jailer. I'm still stuck in my head. But I expect everybody to be able to feel free to walk across the street and talk to the city sergeant or talk to the city lieutenant. And I expect everybody to, that's what I expect. I myself will do the same. And I, Maybe the problem is, is I always looked at everybody as being cooperative and a friend, and I still do. It is the view of the PAC that the Sheriff's Department should set the standard for proactive, aggressive law enforcement and professional responsive service to all residents of Missoula County. What, in your opinion, are ways of doing this? Basically, everything I said. Integrity, professionalism, and service. Everybody does their darndest to get along, to treat each other the way they would like to be treated, to treat the public the way they would like to be treated. You will see calls going up. I've seen it. It's happened under my watch in the Sheriff's Department in the 90s. Calls went up because guys were making arrests. They were arresting people all over. And golly, it was fun. And I want it to happen again. So, for $330, I got my money's worth. And if the next sheriff does some part all and is able to do some part all of these, and it ain't me, that's fine. I can sit down in the federal courthouse and do nothing. I, I didn't mean to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> Basically, you folks deserve it. I want you to have it. 
and I thank you very much for listening to me. Well, we have to have a question period. Does anybody have questions for Don? Excuse me. Apologize. And they got to be short. They can't be long-winded like the speech. <laughs> no, that wasn't that long, was it? I was within no. my half hour, I think. I've got a question. Go. How much of a command presence do you think that the sheriff of Missoula County, the chief law enforcement officer, should take as well as in uh, relation to other public officials and uh, other entities in the county? Should he be, how, how strong should you be? The sheriff is the number one law enforcement officer in the county. Period. That's what it says in the law. And he should be proactive with his with the people who live inside the county of Missoula. And in partnership with the other law enforcement agencies, hopefully he will be the leader. And hopefully he won't take uh, a back seat, shall I say. In other words, I envision the situation where the sheriff does his job. That job is to lead, is to be out front on causes, on initiatives, in other words, get the ball rolling and keep it rolling and show that it's rolling. And the people also doing the same thing because, because by doing that, you know, when I was in the uh, captain, I was in the DUI and I was domestic abuse and victims and, and seat belts and as a post screw up. I should have had other people because when other people work, get involved, they buy into, and when they buy into, then they become very, very productive in that area. So I guess I'm saying the sheriff's department, and I'm not trying to downgrade the city police department or anybody else. I don't mean to, but I just feel that it's the sheriff. Okay. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. <coughs> I talk to friends of mine around the country in the same deal, and I ask them who negotiates their pay, and they look at me like a crazy. They say, well, the sheriff, of course. Here, to us, it looks like we can negotiate against the sheriff and against the county. Now, Yellowstone County, and that one of their negotiations, have tied detention officer pay as a percentage off of sheriffs. And there's talk in the next legislature about bringing that up to the legislature. How do you feel about detention officer's pay being based again as a percentage of the sheriffs like deputies is? My initial reaction is, I don't believe I have a problem with that. My initial reaction. And of course, you always gotta have the caveat, do we have enough money or if, if it's given to us and we gotta do it, it's mandate, then what do we also gotta cut on the other side? I have supported, you know, I was a captain for a lot of years, so out of the association, but every buck that we got for pay just helped everybody out. And I look at that as the deten detention center also. So my initial reaction is I would support that. That's my initial reaction without knowing the books. And listening to somebody, I can ask somebody and probably did ask somebody, how's the budget doing? What you're doing just fine. How's the car budget doing? I know you bought five. It's doing just fine. Well, until I, mean, I get this prospectus from uh, phallic every month and it's about that deep well if they can I guarantee you they can hide everything they want to in there and so it does me no good right now to give you a promise or but that's my answer okay. thank you I appreciate the heck of it speaker tonight is Lieutenant Brad Giffen. He's been uh, with the Sheriff's Department for 17 years. Did I get that right? Yeah. Finally one of them tonight. Brad, the floor is yours. Well, I appreciate the PAC uh, asking everybody to come and talk. I think it's really important that everybody is here because this is about the community. This isn't about the position of Sheriff. It isn't about the position of Justice of the Peace. It's about the community of Missoula picking the people and putting those people, the best people, in the places to run these agencies so that the people of Missoula County get the best possible service for their tax dollar. That's what this is all about. 
And this is the only forum so far that I've been a part of that has allowed us to do that. So I thank you for that invitation. I'd also like to thank everybody for taking part of their night to come here and listen to us speak. I know it's gone on a little bit long. Um, I'm going to make it as succinct as I can and, and get into things that I think are important. Uh, the first thing that I think is important for people to know is a little bit about me. I certainly wouldn't want to vote for somebody that I didn't know anything about. I am a lifetime resident of Missoula County, lived here all my life, grew up with my mom and dad who are here with me um, <clears throat> in, out in East Missoula. Uh, I have deep and really historic ties to the Missoula community, my, uh, not only to the Missoula community itself, the business community, but also to the Missoula law enforcement community. <clears throat> Um, all of you know Warden's Market, downtown Warden's Market, that was my great grandfather Otis Warden and Tyler Warden went together and it was originally the bright spot in downtown Missoula. And then uh, Tyler got bought out by Otis and moved to the location where Warden's Market was before it is where it is today. On the law enforcement side, <coughs> Robert Harkness was my great grandfather and he was the undersheriff for Charles Sharp in, 19, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And his wife Laura Harkness was the first police matron in the city of Missoula. So I have uh, ties to the Missoula community business-wise, and my family's been in, in law enforcement for a long time. Um, most recently, with the exception of me, is my father, Robert Giffen. If you don't know him, um, he's one heck of a man. He's, he's dedicated his entire life to public service, free public service, as a reserve deputy for this community for over 27 years. And he gave a lot of his time and uh, all of his energy now, uh, over that whole 27 years without hardly receiving a dime for it. And I applaud him for it, and I just hope that someday I'll be able to be half the man that he is. Myself and about me and my qualifications, um, again, I don't want to go too, too much into what my qualifications are, but I don't think you can honestly vote for somebody if you don't know at least a little bit of what their qualifications are. I am a Marine Corps, United States Marine Corps veteran. I served uh, with the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. I have 17 years of experience with the Sheriff's Department. And uh, that might not sound like a lot of experience, but in that 17 years, I've done an awful lot. I started out as a Deputy Sheriff, uh, moved on very quickly, uh, became a Senior Deputy and a Senior Deputy too, which is an Assistant Shift Boss in a short period of time. Later promoted to Sergeant, where I worked uh, street team for quite a few years, and we, uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. I spent a short stint in the, as a detective with a detective uh, rotation slot and I'm now currently the training lieutenant in charge of all the training for not only the regular deputies uh, but for the reserve deputies as well. My whole career and the people in this room that know me know that I have always had kind of a fancy for trying to identify deficiencies. And when I've identified something I kind of sometimes go after it a little bit too hard. And it's not always that I've been in a position in the, in the department to actually correct those deficiencies. And I've worked for a lot of good leaders who, who listened to what I had to say. And when they listened to what I had to say and allowed me to do some of the things that I really wanted to do, we had good programs. We had an outstanding canine program. It's one of the best dogs, in my opinion, in, in this state for sure. Um, we have an outstanding field training deputy program. Again, I think it's one of the better field training deputy programs in the state. And I can say that because I've had people go through our program who have been trained by other departments and have made favorable comments. Those are the types of programs and the problems that I've seen in our department in the past and have been able to identify and correct with the help of the administration. So it's important to have that openness in an administration, an administration who listens to people because your people are going to fix your problems for you. I'm a graduate of the National Academy of the FBI. I uh, was twice awarded the Missoula Exchange Club uh, Police Officer of the Year. I'm currently our tactical team leader, and I'm a most, uh, Montana Post Certified Law Enforcement Instructor. So as you can see, there isn't anybody really in the Sheriff's Department that wears just one hat. Um, our county is, is huge geographically. It's over 2,600 square miles in size, and usually you got five guys covering it. 2,600 square miles. So the public needs to be informed about those things. <clears throat> the uh, PAC has asked me to uh, answer a couple of questions. And the first uh, question is, is that in my perspective, in your perspective, what are the most important issues and challenges facing the Sheriff's Department now and in the future? 
I think one of the first and leading problems that we're having in the Sheriff's Department is, is a low morale problem. I've been there through several different administrations and I know the morale right now is low. It's low at the detention center, it's low in the downtown operations. I know it's low in downtown operations because when I was working patrol, we would have overtime opportunities funded by grants that were constantly filled. People would fight over them. You can't give them away now. People don't want to come to work. There's got to be a reason for that. High morale is important to providing an effective service to the community. It's, um, if, if you've got people who are coming to work and don't really want to be there, being a deputy sheriff, being a police officer, being a detention officer, those are all self-starting positions. You can usually do as little as you want, or you can do as much as you want. The higher your morale is, the more you're going to do for your department and the more you're going to do for your community. So looking at the morale issues would be a concern. Funding for downtown operations and detention operations. Again, these are all tax issues. Um, with the exception of taking a strong look at the budget and seeing where the monies are going and where the monies are either coming in or not coming in is going to be a primary focus of my administration. I know that the per diem situation at the detention needs some attention. And it has had some attention in the legislature as far as getting a formula passed. They just haven't plugged any numbers into it. That needs to be a high priority. If you look at it, uh, it, just fixing that one thing alone, there's going to be more money to help better pay people that are out there in the detention center. Facilities. If you're in the downtown operations, you've uh, experienced overcrowdedness. The facilities are horrible. Um, that causes a low morale. And they're looking at building a new facility, a new law and justice facility. And uh, like uh, Don Mormon said, growth is a huge issue. County's not getting any smaller. Houses aren't getting any cheaper. Um, all of those are concerns and issues that the sheriff's going to have to face. And quite frankly, I'm not getting, you know, they're, they're just not going to be favorable answers to everything. But you at least need to listen to what's going on, take the time to know the people that you work with. Um, and I can tell you this right now, if you want a sheriff who uh, doesn't know who you are, then don't vote for me because I plan on knowing everybody at the detention center, everybody in the downtown operations, on a first name basis. I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what your thoughts are. Because it's been my experience that when people listen to good ideas, good things happen for the department and the community. The second question, if elected in the position of sheriff, how would you respond to specific issues such as low morale? Operational funding, unification of divisions such as the patrol, the detective division, and the jail division, and interaction with other local criminal justice agencies. Answering the first question of uh, morale, you have to be an effective, in order to be an effective leader, you have to be attached to the people that you work with. You have to be willing to be seen, you have to have a thick enough skin to have somebody come into your office and say you're messing up, and tell you why, and accept that. Don't bristle up, because when you bristle up, you're not gonna get any communication from them after that period forward. From that period forward, they're never gonna talk to you again. You need to be honest, you need to be open, and you need to be there, listening to what your people have to say. I'm not talking about a micromanagement type of situation where you manage as a sheriff every little thing that goes around. I'm talking about a sheriff who manages his administration and makes sure that his administration is open to the people who are giving him suggestions and maintain that openness with good open door policy. Just a simple thing like recognizing people for a job that's well done. It's hugely important. I mean, money's an issue. Sure, it's an issue. It's an issue for everybody. The cost of housing in Missoula is high. There's never enough money to do what you want, but you can get a lot from a people just by telling them, hey, you did a really good job on that. And that needs to happen more often. As a sheriff, to improve morale, I'd be more supportive of the bargaining units and the grievance process. Those are all legitimate processes. People will always bargain as a bargaining unit for more pay, better working conditions, that's just normal. That's what people do, that's why there are bargaining units. You have to support that. I'm not saying I would give people as a bargaining unit everything they ask for, but I certainly would support their position to ask. And I would support their position to bring a grievance to me and go through a grievance process that's clearly outlined by the numbers. As far as operational funding, again, a high priority would be out to try to fix some of that per diem at the jail. And I think one of the numbers that absolutely has to be put in that formula is the cost of living in the county in which you reside. 
There are three major detention centers across the state, and all of them have different levels of uh, housing. And Missoula is a very expensive place to live. Everybody in this room knows that. That's an important number to include in that. Bottom line, though, with everybody in here, I would like to stand up here and say that I could promise higher pay, better benefits, better this and better that, but those are all issues of the community. The community, the, the Sheriff's Department is operated on a public safety fund, and the public safety fund is voted on by the people of the community. That said, as a sheriff, I would push hard in the community, working with local media outlets, local community groups, people in the community who need to hear what their sheriff's office is doing for them. They need to hear what the sheriff's department is lacking. They need to hear what the detention center is lacking so that they're educated when they go to the polls to vote for these things. People do not automatically vote to raise their taxes. It's not popular. <coughs> but if they're educated and if they know what's going on and they feel like they're part of the system and they're getting a better product out of it, they will vote and they will vote in favor of it. That's how we got the detention center built in the first place. Things like the Citizens Law Enforcement Academy that went away. What, there is no better tool, in my opinion, to educate citizens than to bring them into the detention center and let them see the people working in the jail. Take them out on a patrol ride with a patrol deputy and let them see the calls for service that they respond to. Let them see that they're running from uh, Missoula County out by the Y and running up to Condon and Sealy Lake on a call for service. It's ridiculous. But when people sit in the patrol car, they're in the jail seeing the work that these people do, <clears throat> when they vote, they think about it. Media relations, uh, being a sheriff's deputy, sometimes they can be touchy, but they're hugely important. If you don't have a good working relationship with your media, you're sunk. You have to have the ability to go to your media and let your people be recognized for the job that they're doing. And if one of those things happens to be a bad thing, then don't run away from it. Right up front and honest, don't hide anything, tell the people what happened and move on from there. You'll, you'll far, fare, far, fare far better with honesty than you are trying to shuffle and cover things up and make a story up for this and try to cover up for the story that you just made up. It doesn't work. People make mistakes. Our job especially, people make mistakes because they're making decisions in split seconds and if you look at the number of decisions that they make and they make correctly, you'd be amazed at how good a law enforcement service you have in Missoula County. It's, it's amazing. To me, it's amazing. There also has to be a good working relationship with other governing bodies. County commissioners, very critical people in county government. Um, your bargaining units, the associations. Is it better to sit down with a bunch of people and decide what's best for the community? Or is it better to split everybody apart and have everybody, uh, you know, a little warring factions against each other? There's no cooperation. Nobody's ever going to get anything done that way. We have to be able to work together. Everybody knows what their jobs are, and everybody would like to know what everybody else's job is as a unification type of thing. The third question is the view of the MCCPS pact that the Sheriff's Department should set the standard for proactive, aggressive law enforcement and professional responsive service to the Missoula residents or the residents of Missoula County. Now back up just a little bit, the, on the first question there was a unification of divisions and the things that I would try to do to unify not only the divisions within the department but other agencies within <coughs> Missoula County. Um, there are a lot of things that I think a person can do. I think the biggest hurdle that any sheriff coming into office is going to have is that there's a huge barrier. There's a jail or a detention center on Mullen Road, and then there's the downtown operations two miles away. There are no relationships built. <coughs> we all work for the same team. We are all on the same team, but we don't have the ability to develop any good relationships because the only thing the patrol guys do is stop in and drop a guy off to you, and you guys never, hardly ever make it downtown because of the barrier. You need to close those barriers. Just an idea that I had to, to try to foster some relationships is to have briefings at the jail together. That way the street shift boss knows what's going on in the jail, if it's full, how many people they can take to jail, who can be released, and the shift boss of the jail is going to kind of know the shift that they're working with, get to develop a few relationships. I think it's, it would be a positive thing. Of course, everybody's going to be a little hesitant to change, but overall I think it'd be positive. 
have a little bit of flexibility. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. There's always going to be wants. There's always going to be needs. And nobody can fix them all. So be flexible. I would like to investigate possible partnerships with not only the reserve unit that we have, uh, but the probation and parole people, Montana State Highway Patrol, City Police Department. There's a number of agencies that we could team up with and provide a way better service to our community. Hook up a probation and parole person with a, or a deputy driving a beat. It's a perfect combination. You got search authority with the probation and parole officer, and you got the deputy there to back him up. How about some sex offender registration checks in that combination? It would be a great team effort. <coughs> DUI, Drug Task Force, with the Highway Patrol and the City Police Department. All effective programs, but if the city's going to run theirs over here and we're going to run ours over here, it's not going to be effective. We're all in it together, and as much as we can, try to come together and, and uh, pool our resources to provide the community a better service. One other thing I'd like to just maybe look at, if, if I'm fortunate enough to get the job sheriff, would be with the detention officer and the downtown operations, put some training together. Instead of just having you at the detention center train by yourselves and train your things and the deputies over here doing theirs, there are a lot of things both of them do that are the same. The thing is, is if you don't ever get together in the same room, there are no relationships built and then there's always an us against them atmosphere. And that's just not healthy. We don't need that. We need people to work together on the same team for the same goal. And that can be hard when you're separated by several miles. On to question three about proactive and reactive forces and what, in my opinion, are ways of pursuing it. The way I see it, there are two police forces or two police options available to the community. There's a proactive response, which requires a lot of manpower, and there's a reactive response, which is what we are right now because we don't have any manpower. The bottom line is an uninformed public is going to be happy with what they have right now because it's less expensive. When you look at personnel costs, personnel costs out of the budget that is currently almost $14 million is a huge, huge portion of that budget. The public safety fund can only be increased with the vote of the public. If they're not informed, they're just not going to vote for it. So again, it's incumbent upon not only the detention center, but the downtown operations, support staff, and having a leader who's willing to stand up in front of some of these media organizations and say, my people do good work. My people are running to the ends of the county with five guys in 2,600 square miles. My detention officers are working with a jail that is constantly full. And there aren't too many options for a low amount of pay. And they're still having to live in this community. So how about supporting your employees? You might not get your raise in the public safety fund, but I'll tell you one thing you will get. You'll get an increase in your morale, which is going to result in better service to everybody. And that's important. In closing, I just want to let everybody know that the sheriff's race is really, it's not about me. Um, I thought long and hard before I entered into this circle and, and I, there was a lot of soul searching for me to see if this was really what I wanted to do and if I would be the right person to do the job. I think I am. I'm not pretending by any stretch of the imagination that it would be an easy job because I think it's really hard. But if you vote for me, I'll do my level best to improve the things that I talked about today, recognizing that I can't make any promises requiring increases in pay. I can't make any promises that require increases in fiscal amounts from agencies that I don't have any control over. But I will be an effective leader. And I would really appreciate your vote and your support. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. In other counties around here, um, one allow their detention to be reserve officers. Now here all you get is thoughts against county policy. Well, county policy can't be changed. Uh, second thing I like to throw on that, this county used to be this way and it's sort of gone away. Most other counties in the state still are the same way. When they look to hire, it's uh, post-certified detention and then look at other people. Here's like post-certified, anybody but detention. 
What's your thoughts? First of all, I think your, your thoughts about post-certified and anybody but detention, I don't think that's a real good reflection of what happens because I've seen people from the detention center hired. Uh, if you're talking about preference points for hiring, um, uh, that would be an issue that personnel would have to you know, advise me of legally whether we were able to do that. The reserve deputy issue, on the other hand, the way I understand it, it's a Federal Fair Labors Act type of a thing because you have a, a job that is considered similar and you work for the county. So to, just to give you an example, you put in a 40-hour work week and because you have a job employed by the county that is similar to the job of being a reserve deputy, the county would be obligated to pay you overtime. Um, those are issues that I, I think are the issues that run up against the reserve and the deputy. How are other counties getting around with that? I'm not sure, but it's certainly worth investigating. Now I know by statute there's only a few different authorizations. As a sheriff, I could make you an auxiliary officer, which by law says you cannot carry a weapon. The other option I would have is to make you a special auxiliary officer, which in which you could carry a weapon, but you would have to be trained in the, that special um, duty that I would want you to perform. So that might be an option. Or you can be a reserve deputy, or you can be a sworn deputy. I think and those, all those classifications are in the same part of the Montana statutes. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to go over to the legislature and get a detention officer definition put in there in the legislative package within you know those four definitions so we can maybe have a little bit more leeway. And, and again, all of those things, if people aren't willing to ask the questions, the leader doesn't know all the answers. There's way too much to know. But a lot of that sounds like it's, it, they are good ideas that are worthy of investigation. I certainly wouldn't say no to any of them. But I wouldn't be able to say, yeah, we can do it, because I'm not sure of the legalities. And, but it's certainly worth looking at. All manpower, extra manpower is always welcome. Did I answer your question? Anyone else? Yes, I just got one question. I keep asking questions. Um, Lieutenant Giffen, I, I know that uh, you've been a, a sheriff's deputy, a peace officer at the state of Montana for 17 years. Um, I guess one of the concerns um, for myself, as even being the, the president of our Deputy Sheriff's Association, is the uh, welfare and well-being of, of the deputies within Missoula County. Um, one of the things, I guess, concerns that I see maybe neglected year in and year out um, throughout the whole state, I know that uh, Yellowstone County has recently taken this on, I'm not sure where they're at right now, is the fact that deputy sheriffs as far as the legislature, and I'm not sure if it's as far as the legislature or if it's as far as, as far as Missoula County is concerned, are not police officers or highway patrolmen considered when it comes to workman's comp issues, we are left out because it says police officer or highway patrolman. Yeah. Would that be something that you would be interested in taking on with the legislature or with even the uh, <clears throat> the Sheriff's and Peace Officers Association. And just for your own benefit, the Montana Sheriff's and Peace Officers Association is already looking into addressing that problem. Uh, that was looked at at the last legislative session and it went, it went through uh, faster than it was reviewed, basically. And the Montana Sheriff's and Peace Officers Association is working on that aspect of it and I would support it wholeheartedly. All right, thank you for your time, appreciate it. tonight we appreciate your participation make sure on June 6th you get out and vote your vote does matter encourage your friends and neighbors to do the same have a good night Thank you.